Good evening and welcome to um, Declassified's new AMA. Um, we are very pleased to have with us tonight a special guest. Um, that's not Matt Kennard, our head of investigations, or Phil Miller, our chief reporter, or myself, the editor of Declassified, but it is uh, John Pilger, a, uh, someone whose work over the, over the last few decades is, is very hard to, to sum up ad adequately. Um, I wrote some years ago that uh, John is the most outstanding journalist in the world. And, and when you look at what he's done, it's pretty amazing. In his, in his long career, he's reported what other journalists have not from places like Palestine, Vietnam, Cambodia, East Timor, Australia, South Africa, Burma, and many other places. And John's articles and, and his books over the decades, I think are a, a treasure trove of, of truth about the real roles of the US, Britain, and Australia in particular. And he's told the story of, of the, their victims as well, and allowing their voices to reach um, to reach people when otherwise they 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 didn't, uh, or they were silenced by other journalists or, or media. The Timorese, the Cambodians, the the Vietnamese, the Chagossians. John spent over twenty years as a reporter and chief foreign correspondent at the Daily Mirror, when it was good, and also worked at Reuters uh, and World in Action, among other places. As all of you will know, I'm sure, John is a world-renowned filmmaker and he's made dozens of films which have reached millions of people. Most recently, The Dirty War on the NHS, The Coming War on China, Utopia, which is about John's homeland, Australia, and the plight of uh, its indigenous people, and The War You Don't See, which I was delighted to be a part of, which was about media and, and propaganda in the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. John, thanks very much for being with us tonight. It's a great pleasure to have you. Thank you, Mark, and thank you for those, those very generous words. And it's good to see you, uh, an old friend, and, uh, and Matt and Phil, whose work uh, I admire. Great. Thanks a lot, John. So the, the format for everyone is if, if people could put their questions uh, into the Q&A box, which you should see at the bottom of your screen. And I'll do my best to field those to John or perhaps to Phil and Matt as well. Um, write, your, uh, write your questions in there uh, and we'll try and get through as many as we can. We might not be able to get through all of them. Um, I actually wanted to kick off and ask John a, a first question whilst everyone else is thinking about what questions they want to ask. And that is, John, I, I was wondering if you could sum up what, what you kind of think of the state of the, the UK media at the moment when it comes to covering important foreign, foreign policy issues, international affairs. I mean, do, do you think that the state of the UK media has got worse? Have you, have you noticed that, mm. that it's got worse over the, over the decades? What, how, 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 how do you think about that? Yes. Well, it's definitely got worse. It's, Perhaps worse isn't the right word. It's uh, uh, because I've always believed uh, the media, I've come to believe and come to know that the media is an extension of the established order. So uh, we can only do so much to wring our hands to ask the, uh, those who wish to rule over us and control what we think, um, to uh, be nice. Uh, but most certainly the media has changed. In my journalistic lifetime, um, the great changes has been the closing down of spaces for people like myself. You know, I'm, my whole career has been in the mainstream. As you mentioned, I was on the mirror when it was the biggest sell selling tabloid in Britain, second biggest after uh, the China Daily, uh, Peking, sorry, Peking Daily, uh, in the world, uh, very mainstream. In those days, and from, 
quite a few years after that, there were spaces for the likes of me. There were spaces for people I would call mavericks or I prefer to call as real journalists, uh, especially in reporting foreign affairs. I'm glad you distinguish between foreign affairs and domestic affairs because the media is very good at reporting party scandals. Um, you know, we've had we've had a tsunami of Tory scandals and all courtesy of a of a of a, a, a salivating media. That's it, it it likes that. But move away from that. Come back from that. Try and get context to those events and especially go out to the reporting of the world. And things have changed hugely. Um, as I say, those spaces have closed down. My own newspaper career ended um, really as the, um, uh, the, the, uh, the coup, the American engineer coup in uh, Ukraine happened in 2014 when I was writing a column was published every fortnight for the Guardian, um, and that was that was the end of that. I was telephoned and told that my services weren't needed anymore. Now I have had the honour of being fired by uh, a number of people, especially Robert Maxwell, uh, and that's I wear that as a great badge of honour. But um, this marked really the end of my time in the newspaper world. I should say that ITV still welcomes my documentaries. Uh, and for a number of reasons, but they do. They have, there is a tradition in ITV. It's hard to imagine with I'm a celebrity and all the rest of it that uh, are still alive among a number of people there who like to look back on those days when World in Action was such a, a powerful journalistic voice. Um, but, you know, I'm fortunate. Uh, my documentaries get big audiences and ITV is fully aware of that. If there was a young me starting now in television, I wouldn't uh, get that space. I've no doubt about that. So there, Mark, those, that's, that's really the change. Uh, it, it, you know, you, you, there was always one cranky maverick in a, a situation that you look to, to find out the truth what was going on. If you go back to the, the explosion of the atomic bomb over Japan, there's so many lies around that. The major lie was put out by the New York Times, uh, uh, which, which said that, uh, that, that radioactivity was not part of the, the effects of this bomb, that it was simply the blast effect. Uh, later, it emerged that the New York Times reporter was in actually in the pay of the Pentagon. I mean, <laughs> up to a few years, they don't have to pay journalists now. The service is free. Uh, but up to uh, a few years ago, uh, certainly in the United States and to some degree in this country, uh, journalists had uh, very shadowy relationships with the uh, with with the what they call in the U.S. the dark state. Uh, now, in 1945, up came uh, a supreme maverick, Wilfred Burchett, a countryman of mine, who, uh, employing all the journalistic wiles. Uh, got a train across uh, a very sullen and strange Japan from Tokyo, where uh, he'd been told, he'd been, uh, where he was embedded with the 
with the Allied uh, occupation across to Hiroshima. And his front page, which I have on my wall here, the atomic play, I write this as a warning to the world. Uh, just the story of how Birch had got this, his copy out is absolutely thrilling. Uh, and But the fact that as a result of this, he was pretty well kicked out of Japan, uh, or rather had great difficulty getting back. So a Birchard would not happen today. That's how it's changed. Thanks, John. That's a really useful overview of some of the real problems with uh, current, current reporting. And it's in very interesting to hear you talk about this closing down of media spaces. Um, we've, got a, we've got a load of questions that have come in, actually. So I'll, I'll, we'll, we'll try and zip through them maybe as fast as we can. Uh, it, uh, th there's been a number of questions about Julian Assange, uh, yeah. John. And uh, I, I wanted to sort of try and bring those together and, and, and simply ask you, obviously you know Julian very well, you've campaigned for him for years. Mm -hmm. um, can you say how you view his current situation and what you think the prospects are for his freedom? Well, his prospects are not very good, to say the least. He is in the midst of yet another arcane how do I describe it, quasi-appeal basis. He's waiting. His lawyers have presented their response to an American response, to the Home Secretary's response, to a single judge sitting in the court who will decide whether the High Court will accept another appeal. Um, it's very difficult to keep up with. Um, but um, this could keep this, this so-called process or non-process could keep Julian in Belmarsh prison, prison for another year or two. Uh, but at, 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 um, the problem there is the single judge. I've sat in some of these courts and these judges sitting with our jury, especially the Lord Chief Justice and some of the senior judges in England have brought down the most disgraceful judgments, uh, opinions on Julian's case, allowed the US to, uh, to, to out of, uh, uh, to, to, to present itself as, uh, um, uh, as 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 worthy of giving assurances that Julian won't be tortured, uh, won't be put into a into a hellhole, um, ignoring the law. It's it's been very very difficult to sit in court and watch this. So I can only be, I suppose, um, hopeful. He has the most extraordinary support in Stella, his wife. He has the most wonderfully formidable person of very considerable intellect and energy. So his family, his father, um, uh, the campaign behind him, uh, it's inspiring. Um, so, that's all very important because how one human being could, could withstand this pressure, I don't know. I have, whenever I visited Julian and I've tried to put myself in his position, I haven't been able to. Um, but he, his resilience is quite extraordinary. Um, I'm afraid that's all I can tell you. There are loose ends at the moment. No, thanks, John. Uh, and just to flag up that um, we've been doing at Declassified a lot of work on, on the conflicts of interest in the Julian Assange case, uh, particularly Matt Kennard uh, has been leading on that work for us. And you know, we've been publishing stories this week and we have other stories coming out over the next few days. So yeah. I'd like to ask people to keep an eye out for them uh, in, you know, in what is a horrendous, a horrendous persecution. 
Um, can, can we come on to another subject actually? Because um, one, one question from David Cohen, this is a question about Israel-Palestine, John, which is obviously an issue that you've worked on a lot over, over the years. So David Cohen asks, do you think that the UK mainstream media will ever give a true and accurate picture reporting on, on Israel-Palestine? I'm not a futurist, David, like, especially when it comes to the media. But um, the answer, my guess is no. Um, there's nothing, no evidence in the present. There is some evidence in the past, in that past that I mentioned, recent past even. I mean, there was a time, there was a time when the Guardian newspaper, uh, uh, which had some fine people uh, reporting the Middle East, no more, no more. So, um, <clears throat> I can't answer anything but negatively to that. Yeah. On, on the issue of Ukraine and the current, current war there, we've got a question from uh, Angus Gillies who, who asks, are, are you surprised how effective the, the mainstream media continues to be post Iraq and, and post Afghanistan in controlling the public mind, he says. Uh, and I, I've been alarmed at the lack of skepticism about the media narrative regarding Ukraine. <laughs> this is something that you've you've spoken about and, and and written about recently, isn't it? Yes, it's it's a it's a very interesting way to put it because I was thinking that as you were speaking, Mark, and I suppose I am a little surprised because uh, you know I'm a <clears throat> I'm an optimist, I, <laughs> which one has to be, but after the Iraq debacle, when finally, or rather through this grip effect, it was exposed that the whole thing was a lie and the media had been uh, drawn into the lie, um, then I, I thought that perhaps it will be modified. The, 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 the illusion the, the duping would be modified next time. But instead we've had over Ukraine something I've never seen before, and that is a sort of tsunami of propaganda where uh, not only are opposing views or informed views on whatever part of this of, of, of the, the, the war there, uh, none of them have been allowed in. And not only have they been not allowed in, those wanting to give another view have been threatened, um, threatened by the government, threatened by ministers, threatened by other journalists. Um, uh, surely people seeing this, having any sense of the, the kind of intimidation against uh, a pluralistic reporting, can I call it that? So, yes, of Ukraine, um, will we'll understand something of what the Julian Assange case is about and why it's so important. Um, so it, it's... I mean, I was just today, I read that uh, there was a, a photograph in somewhere I saw of, of Mrs. Zelensky, the, she's called the First Lady of Ukraine. Uh, and she was at a war crimes exhibition uh, opposite Parliament House, uh, being shown around Russian war crimes, that is, Russian war crimes. So there are no war crimes on the Ukrainian side. No Russian prisoners of war are being shot. This war is completely different from all other wars where there are crimes on both sides. But no, not this one. This is as one side only. And the way this was presented is as if, as if it was normal, that, that's it, they're Russian war crimes. They may well be Russian war crimes. Uh, 
we, we need to see all the evidence. Uh, but after the First World War, did the, uh, did the Germans really eat babies in Belgium? Hmm, unlikely. Uh, but um, a lot of people believe that, Mark. There is, that's the symmetry with the First World War. When people flocked into cinemas, absolutely fill cinemas to bursting to see reconstructed, dramatized versions of the front, often romanticized versions of the front, in the hope of learning something about what had happened to their loved one and what was going on with the war. They were so denied that. Not quite the same because we do have the net and we do have a summons app, such as this, what you're doing right now, a summons app, that's what it is. Uh, but it's similar. Thanks, John. Um, could, could we come on to a question about The Guardian? Um, as people might know, this is one of my favorite subjects and uh, <laughs> something that Declassified has done a lot of work on. Um, Looking at, looking at the Guardian's foreign policy reporting or, or the absence of it. Um, th th there's a question from Ahmed Hussein, who asks, um, I used to be what you might call a, a hereditary Guardianista, but I now find myself looking elsewhere. And he actually says, fights like declassified full of ex-Guardian journalists. Um, is it, and then he asks, is it my imagination that there used to be genuine dissent at The Guardian that barely exists now? And, and if so, when did that change? Do you, yes. John? yes, I'm sorry, I've said, I say that quite, because I know that, you know, um, <clears throat> one, of the, one of the best, I mean, these were dissenters who learned how to navigate through the, through the Guardian system, which uh, a number of them, my friends, where they, regarded the Guardian as a kind of civil service that they had to find their way through. Seamus Mill was one of the best. Tony wrote a superb book on the basis of his Guardian reporting called The Enemy Within, about and especially about the media's relationship then with the police and the, uh, and the Thatcher government in its campaign to crush the miners, um, uh, Victoria Britain, who um, edited uh, a page which it's unbelievable to think that it was actually in The Guardian. It was called, it had the rather ordinary name of Third World Report. But in that, Victoria marshaled reporting from the developed world in which she told about liberation movements and about people in struggle. And I could go on. Uh, there were a number of other reporters, especially in Latin America. Um, they've all gone. I don't see any of them no. reporting, the, reporting the world for The Guardian. We have some people now who are an absolute disgrace, especially in the reporting of uh, uh, Ukraine, Russia, um, but the others. Are... And, and what about the BBC, John? Uh, we've we've got a question from David Speedy, who's, who's based in the US, who asks, "What what's the state of the BBC uh, uh, as you see it?" I don't know. I've I've worked very briefly for the BBC, uh, and. Um, um, Public news service. Look, I, I'm worried about. <laughs> is it a public news service? Do you think, or is it a an instrument of state propaganda? Is what is it's it's the most refined propaganda service in the world. You you all these doe-eyed people in the United States and elsewhere think liberal, good liberal hearts think they're getting the truth because it's coming from the BBC. And the BBC is an extraordinary organization. It's had some brilliant reporters. It's done some epic things, 
that perhaps no other broadcaster hasn't. That's why its news propaganda has such credibility, because the BBC, and in many cases, rightly so, has such a huge amount of, of credibility. Um, and <clears throat> the same applies to The Guardian. You know, it's why there are people still hanging on to The Guardian, believing they're getting uh, uh, they're, they're getting a, a, a reasonable view, uh, a truthful view of much of the world. Um, but the, 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 I find BBC News unwatchable. I haven't watched it for quite a long time because I haven't got the time to deconstruct it always. It doesn't give information. That's what news is meant to be. It gives views. And behind, I've always found it amusing, bemusing, that the BBC, so many people in the BBC see themselves as having entered through entered into a nirvana of objectivity, as if objectivity and impartiality have been, uh, have, have been uh, given to them intravenously. Andrew Marr was very good at waxing on about this. Andrew Marr, the political editor of the BBC, who made a victory speech virtually on behalf of Tony Blair, <laughs> outside number 10 Downing Street in 2003. I wrote, I wrote it down where he said, uh, um, he, he said, um, uh, I remember it. Yeah, here it is. Tony Blair, he said, tonight as the troops have gone into Iraq has been proved conclusively right. <laughs> conclusively right. And Andrew Marr was absolutely eloquent in talking about the BBC as a national treasure of objectivity. Amazing. It's called Orwell called it double talk. Double talk. Yeah. John, we've had a load of questions about your documentaries and um, I, I listed some of your most recent ones and I'm sure that a lot of people watching tonight will have seen multiple of your, of your films. I mean, trying to collapse some of the questions together, but basically are you working on any new documentaries at the moment and another question is what would you be able to pick out one of the many films that you've made that you think has been your most important the one that you think has I don't know either had most impact or you've been most proud of no oh, that's that's a hard one there I have to say and I feel exhausted even saying it there are 61 of them Mark and uh, 61 films, is it really that many? Yeah. Incredible, okay. <laughs> That's my reaction. Um, look, so it's hard. It's, it's other, some reactions of, I suppose a, a reaction that really shook me and it was a time when there was no social media there was television, and it still is to many, in many respects, was people's major source of information. Uh, and that was 1979, when my documentary, Year Zero, The Silent Death of Cambodia, um, was broadcast. Uh, now, what was remarkable is that it actually followed uh, a major report in the Mirror. The Mirror devoted most of two issues to my reports from Cambodia. Can you imagine that now? Most of two issues. There were something like 25 photographs throughout the paper. Um, began on the front page and went right through the paper. Following this, about two months later, my film, uh, Cambodia Year Zero, was broadcast. And 
The audience was vast. I'm not sure what it was, but it was would have outdone the football audiences that we we now see. Uh, and but what really shook me because I wasn't expecting this was the support for the people of Cambodia that poured in from ordinary people in this country. Um, you know, with an, and this had to come by letter. Um, it was then the ITV company was then ATV. Um, so people wrote to wherever they could find an address and millions came in to the point where the, the end of that film unsolicited raised almost $50 million. Um, and uh, but it, it wasn't in any way meant as a, a charitable exercise because it was telling some very hard political truths, such as the, the rise of the Khmer Rouge was brought about by the secret bombing of Kissinger and Nixon. Uh, and the, the, the catalyst that that carnage from the air had, uh, had, had, had uh, created in, in creating this monster. Um, so it, I suppose that film on many levels, because it's, it's, it's public reaction, I mean, the, the BBC, of all, I've never usually, BBC and ITV, they look at each other on a subject like this and try to produce spoilers. On this, on this case, uh, uh, the B BBC devoted its, all its children's programs to uh, uh, an extraordinary bring and buy sale right throughout the country, in which primary schools all over Britain were remember Cambodia. And it was with information. This wasn't, this wasn't simply sentimental. It was with information. Um, so I suppose almost the visceral reaction, public reaction of that film uh, was such that it's all it's always stood out in my mind but there have been other films that have had similar reactions but in a different in a different sense a different way well i would say yeah to anyone watching this who hasn't seen the silent death of cambodia to to watch it because it is an extremely powerful film like like your other films john but that yeah, I mean, it, it deals with such harsh issues. I mean, the rise of the Khmer Rouge is one of the worst episodes in Britain, in, in well, world history, really, <laughs> of the last hundred years, probably. Uh, and yeah, you could have chosen a lot of other films as well. Your documentation of the plight of the Shagossians, the East Timorese, the Vietnamese, the Burmese, all these very powerful films that you've made, but Thanks for. I have to say, the plight of the Chagossians stealing a nation uh, very much complemented your own work, Mark. Uh, all that, all those many, many hours you you spent uh, out at queue in the in the public archives and uh, found this extraordinary evidence. Um, I mean, filmmaking is, I have to say, very quickly. Uh, a team make if you can get that team to work. I was fortunate to work with a filmmaker called David Munro. David made the Cambodia film with me. <laughs> I would say it's David and I were probably, well, it's, I've always looked on as the best relationship I've had in my life. Um, we knew what the other wanted. We complemented each other, and over a period of, uh, I suppose, well, on and off for a period of 15 years or so, we produced a number of documentaries in difficult places, undercover often, East Timor particularly, 
Burma uh, and other places. But it was the two of us working together. Thank you, John. Um, I just wanted to interject to say that for those of you who don't know our work at Declassified, please do visit our website. If you don't know it, declassifieduk.org. Find us on Twitter, Declassified UK. Um, we're trying to do something different to the corporate media, trying to tell the truth about Britain's global footprint. And unlike the traditional media, we try to serve the public, not the state or, or corporations, but we are run on a very small budget. There's, we only have four staff. Um, I, I like to think that we've revealed more about UK foreign policy in the last three years, thanks to Matt and Phil primarily actually, than the rest of the mainstream media combined. We've done that on a very small budget with a very small number of people. Um, but my plea is we do need more people to join us and you can become a member of Declassified, actually from as little as two pounds a month. We deliberately set the, the cost very low. We know that it's difficult times financially for most of us. Uh, hundreds of people have joined us as members recently, but we, we do need more people. So please, if you can join us, um, you should find uh, uh, somewhere in the Q&A a link where you can join. Otherwise, you can you can find how to join us uh, on our website or from or from Twitter. Um, John, can I come back uh, to ask you another question? Um, there's a there's a question from Iva D, or it could be Eva D. I'm not sure if I've mispronounced your name. Who says I'm a big fan? What's your opinion on the current state of the Labour Party? Oh. <laughs> Um, hmm. Well, however, that's that's, a, that's almost an impossible one in, uh, in a short time. But um, I've never belonged to the Labour Party. I have to say, uh, once or twice in desperation, I did vote for the Labour Party, um, but I learned my lesson. Um, What's the state of it? In many ways, you know, the Labour Party is reverting to what it was. You know, back, back in even Harold Wilson's time, James Callaghan's time, where they had something called consensus politics. Now, this, these were quite polite politics. And in fact, there were some very civilized Tories around at the time, nice people. Um, and the, the likes of uh, um, um, some of the people who are now in government had yet been born, but Labour learned to be a solid right-wing party. Uh, it did make some changes, but then the Tories also made social changes in this country. You go back Harold Macmillan's time. So it, that's why I say in some respects, the Labour Party is reverting to that, what it was, a right-wing party. It was never a left-wing party. It had a left-wing branch, of course it did. Uh, but even that was <clears throat> much graduated and uh, people who called themselves, I mean, those are the days when people who were in the Labour Party or voted Labour, call themselves socialists. Uh, I was slightly amused by that, but it was good heart, you know, calling themselves socialists. They weren't socialists, they were social democrats. But even social democracy, so much of social democracy is gone. So, um, and I'm not saying that Keir Starmer's Labour Party is going back to the halcyon days of social democracy. It's just becoming a solidly right-wing organization again. John, we've had various questions and we, we, we had some earlier in the day actually, um, pointing towards how you began, which is talking about because of this closing down of, of media space, mm. what can, how can journalists, how can young journalists seeking a career who want to report independently, critically, in the public interest, 
is there a future for them and um, how 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 can they get a career where where can they go what can they do oh there are there are many <coughs> excuse me there are many answers to that mark i mean your organization is one you know you find a declassifier and you you join it you have to um i i think there is something about those young journalists, and I know them, that want to be want to be the kind of journalist that almost barely exists today. They have to. There's a quite a bit of struggle involved, but they have to follow their star. They have to hang on to what they want to be. Uh, that doesn't mean assuming something about themselves. There are, there's a lot of perhaps young journalists who go into the system and imagine they're being independent uh, by being prematurely cynical, that is cynical about their audience, instead of being cynical about false authority. That's quite a hard one. You have to have a skepticism. That's not even strong enough a word, but you have, you, you have to be all the time on guard against false authority because in every walk of life, there is going to be a line, a spin, and you have to understand that carefully that that applies to sports reporters as, as much as it does to political reporters if you don't and i realize this is a broad brush i'm speaking with here but if you don't you become part of a club and we see the westminster group as the ultimate club um where the it's you can interchange the politician and the and the political editor. Um, that, that's, that's, I would thought, that's not the journalist you want to be. Uh, so um, it's taking risks, it's going overseas, um, it's getting into a situation where there isn't much competition and that perhaps you can tell the story and then, then you're noticed and you have something that you uh, can claim as your own. There are so many ways of doing this, but if you have the energy and uh, the, the, perhaps the inspiration, I don't know, uh, it's very difficult to think of the word, but it, it, just the sheer unadulterated enthusiasm to be a journalist and define that as finding out what the hell is going on. You may not get the whole truth, but you'll get some of it. That's good. Go and get it. And along the way, a lot of people are going to throw traps in front of you. Just be aware of that. Thank you, John. And that, that follows on nicely, actually, from um, a comment from Yago Soto, who says, thanks for, organizing, thanks for organizing this event. You're all big inspirations. And I'd love to hear your advice for as aspiring journalists wanting to work outside the large media institutions and wanting to maintain critical integrity and you've you've really addressed that john and and yeah i mean to reiterate that that was a key reason why why we set up declassified actually to try and pull in um independent journalists who, who are wanting to tell the truth who are wanting to investigate on um uk foreign policy and and who, and who don't actually have a platform at the moment because that platform just doesn't exist in the in the mainstream or there's a very narrow window in the mainstream uh, and on some subjects there really is no window at all 
Um, so yeah, I see that as a as a key as a key role that that we at Declassified are trying to play. Obviously, we're doing it with a tiny budget, <laughs> uh, so our resources are so limited. We're not able to support you know the the number of journalists that we know are out there who who would write for us um, if 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 um, they could make a living out of it. So that that is a great frustration on our part, but the. But the thrust of what we're trying to do is, is, I think, a really important one. And the move towards independent media is, is absolutely central to, to, to our mission. Um, well, Mark, we're all part of This is, you know, the Samazov, which arose uh, in the Gorbachev years uh, as the Soviet Union fell apart. Uh, I'm not liking it exactly, but that's what we are. We're now not a fourth estate, as Burke called it. We are a fifth estate. Uh, and we're all in it. Those who are starting and those who've long been in it, like myself. There's a, there's a comment from Gustavo F. who says 61 documentaries with, a quest, uh, with a, an exclamation mark afterwards. And he asked, where can we watch them? I think they're all on your website john aren't they johnpilger.com yeah that's a lot of people don't, are not aware of that not all of them uh there's a few missing not many uh but it's uh, www.johnpilger.com you go to video there it is great and des lambit asks if you had the resources what would what would be the most important global topic that you would now address in in a new well i think he's referring to a film what what would be that film that you would make with unlimited resources well you didn't say unlimited actually that's maybe a bit unrealistic <laughs> oh, um look it's the same one mark it is about it is about um struggle it's about ordinary people i would say that the way Ordinary people uh, are, are still struggling for the kind of things that you and I will take for granted. My first book was called Heroes, and Heroes was about those ordinary people. I, when I first started traveling as a young reporter, I couldn't believe all over the world that people in such dire circumstances could achieve what they'd achieve, but their enemies need to be written about. There is a class war in this country um, coming from the parties, the political parties. Uh, it's building up into something given the euphemism of austerity. Uh, writing, exposing that getting people so that people are on the right track, even about their own situation. They understand what this is. This is, this is, this is not uh, some divinity that has put them into abject poverty or stopped them getting a job or, or put somebody of great promise onto, onto a delivery moped, no. Uh, and that's in our relatively rich, relatively very rich society. But all over the world where people are not rich, uh, that's, it's, it's understanding that struggle. And that struggle is happening in the most extraordinary way everywhere. That's why China is so interesting and the, and the the whole story of modern China is denied to us. Uh, we don't have to like the government, I'd say, quick, quick disclaimer, don't have to like the government, um, don't have to agree with uh, its draconian ways, but the, the whole, this of a, of a, of a country that was the, the victim of imperial forces for 150 years, uh, for the changes that have gone in and that, it's just extraordinary. Uh, and so 
there that's that that comes under context in understanding societies understanding why uh, Russia is behaving the way it is. One only has to look back to the Russia of the 90s. These are these, this, this, so it's, it's understanding the history of the struggle of ordinary people uh, and uh, their failures, but also their successes. And there have been many successes in modern times. That, that, I'm sorry I expanded that, but that's, it's, it's, it's that venerable subject of struggle, of people uh, trying to do best by their families, their children, to see their children don't die from malaria, um, uh, to earn a decent living, to live out a life generally of modesty, uh, but that is denied, seems to me, to be the greatest social crime still. Well, thanks. Um, we're running out of time. We've just got less than five minutes to go. And there, there are loads of questions, which obviously we can't get through. Um, but one, one key question is asked by Sean Whiteman, which is asked, where, where, do, you, where do you go for your news sources? What, which, which places do you think are, would you encourage people to go to, apart from declassified, obviously? But uh, where, where else would you, would you recommend that people go to for, for independent analysis, independent news? I think I'd probably list a few of them. A couple may be out of date on my website, which may be useful to people. But uh, yes, as I say, they're all part of the so-called underground now. Uh, um, certainly... Uh, consortium news. Uh, I'm on the board of the consortium and I, I write for it uh, occasionally is, is uh, that's consortiumnews.com. I would, I, it's one of those I recommend. Uh, there, there, there are a number of others and there are so many that they pop up. There's a, a group of of veteran journalists, very fine journalists, who have started a, a site called The Scrum. Uh, you have to pay to get in, but that's okay. Uh, as Mark says, these things are not free. Uh, but um, there are a number of others that I, I think it's also important that you that you follow your own instinct, that you navigate through the net. Um, and after a while, you will find something that you begin to trust because you've read the material again and again. It's doing something that's different, and yet it's doing something that's credible. Uh, and there's, there's plenty there. There's plenty there. Uh, certainly on, on the media, a media lens, which has been uh, a powerful dynamic site for over 20 years. Uh, one of the real pioneers in this country will give you a critique of the subject that we're talking about tonight, the media, the British media, that is second to none. Um, so um, go and look, that's my advice. Thanks, John. And do you, do you remain optimistic that we, that we can achieve change, that you know, people working together up against the walls of secrecy, up against these huge, enormous powers that do control how the world works in many ways? you know, the wars, the weapons, the, the enormous informational power that they have. Uh, do, do you remain optimistic? And, uh, you know, looking back over the last few decades that we, we can bring about positive influence? Uh, <laughs> yes, uh, I probably do. I'm not sure, Mark. It's difficult, isn't it? 
Um, and certainly following and being with Julian Assange through his struggle has taught me how high the walls are. Uh, but they're walls and they can be climbed. Um, and it, it's, it's, it, I mean, without optimism, we all give up, don't we? We give up and say, why, why have declassified? Why be a journalist? Uh, why do anything? Why not simply become uh, uh, an Orwellian creature that is instructed to do every day? Uh, what those who wish to control you want you to do. Well, no thanks. No. John, thanks so much for, for joining us tonight. We really appreciate you, you coming and, and giving us your words of wisdom. Um, thanks for everyone for joining. Do support Declassified if you can. Would really encourage you to do that. I'm really sorry that we have not been able to get through all of the questions. I mean, we've had loads of questions. Uh, it's just not possible uh, in the time limited uh, time limit that we had. Um, thank you for joining us. Keep reading Declassified. Uh, thank you very much again, John, uh, and see you soon.